Our mission started in, it's MEA Missions, was started in 1982 with uh, my grandpa and my father who were the first ones to go down. Uh, when we first, I actually lived there for about 10 years. It's been a while, but I do speak pretty flu, flu, uh, fluent Spanish. And uh, uh, it started in 1982 in the Dominican Republic, and then we worked a lot into 82, which started in 1985. In the Dominican Republic, we have 16 churches that are actually church buildings that are built, that we built. Uh, in between those 16 churches, there are over 1,100 adult members, and that they don't count the kids from up to the age of 12, so there's probably close to 2,000 if you count the kids. Uh, and that's not counting the little outstations there that they start, because like a church here, what they do in the Dominican is, because of travel and they don't have vehicles to travel like we do, we, we can't drive, they don't drive a half hour to church, so if it's not close to them, they don't go, because they don't have the transportation. So they'll start another home, like a home church or a small, rent a small building, and they might only start out with like five or six people, but then we're all different people, it's not pulling people from any other church, and then once that builds up to 20, 25 people that are going there, then we consider building a church here. And uh, that's in the Dominican Republic. There's also a correspondence Bible school that we have in the Dominican Republic. There are 42 people enrolled this year. It's a three-year program. There are 16 in their second year. The others are in their first year. And there's already about 15 waiting for the next sign-up date. So that's been going along really well. And we also have, in Haiti, we have a food program that is supported by MEA Missions. Uh, a minimum of $800 goes out every month, and they buy 100 pound in bags of rice and beans and split them up into one pound bags and hand them out to the people. And there's also a clinic in Haiti that we have that runs about, it's been, it's going to be reopening. It was shut down temporarily, but it's about two days a week. It's like a free clinic for people to come get uh, care that can't afford it. Uh, and in, a, in Haiti, there are 13 churches. Uh, the 13th church just got, they just finished that one about two months ago. So there are 13 churches there with, I believe the last number I got was close to 800 members there. So there's a lot of people for the area. The Dominican Republic and Haiti Island is not really that big. There are a total between, there's about 11 million in the Dominican Republic and 11.2 million in Haiti. So there are over 22 million people on, on that island. There's a lot of people. Uh, it's It would be nothing to go down with a group of 20 people in one day to hand out 2,000 tracks, it would happen easy. I mean, that's how many people there are. And they're very open. Uh, you'll be handing out the tracks, and they'll actually chase you down for one if you miss them. So, uh, But uh, as far as us going down, we want to uh, help the work expand and grow. And a lot of the churches that were built a while ago need a lot of maintenance. So I'm, I'll be headed up all the construction there and try to get them repaired and stuff like that. But we want to see the work of God grow on and expand. And about four years ago, we did purchase a home in the Dominican Republic. Uh, it's a three-bedroom house. And we felt to build another house on top of it. They built houses on top of houses because they're all cement and tile. And so we will be living on top, and the downstairs will be open for missions. And so it will be open for anybody to come down that wants to see what we're doing. We'll get them involved. You want to preach, you want to hand out tracts, you want to do puppet shows, anything you want to do, uh, we can set you up. So uh, we just want people to see what's going on and to get more people down there to see the work of God. Amen. Amen. I didn't hear if he mentioned it, but we will be moving at the end of August. Um, we're looking at August 23rd, and our first term, we're looking at about three, 
Years give or take, however long God wants us there, but when we come back, it'll only be for a short time, just for a furlough to kind of gather back up funds, and we'll be right back down in the Dometic, because this is what God has called us to. This is where our passion, our hearts, our lives have, have led us, and, and we are so excited for what God has. Um, and just to kind of give you a background, like Jeff said, he grew up in the Dominic. His dad was a missionary down there, and instilled very much so a call for missions into um, Jeff. And for Jeff, he's going back home. I love going to the Dominic with my husband because we get to see all his childhood friends and, and people he grew up with and those places that he was at. You know, for him, he sees many of his friends that have fallen away from God, many that he grew up with who are no longer serving God, and he has a burden and a, and a passion to call them back and to call them back into the place um, where God and has... Um, helped them before and and obviously when you're not following God you know you start falling back into the life of sin and and with that comes the toils of sin and we'd like to see them set free for me I was a child I grew up um, and I remember reading a book about David Livingston and that book that small book that's what started my passion and as I read that book as a child, I couldn't have been more than seven. I thought, God, I don't know where, I don't know how, and I don't know when. But I know beyond the shadow of a doubt that's where you called me to go. You called me to go somewhere else. And I can't explain to you what it's like to love a nation, to love people you don't know, the people you've never met. But that's what God does. When he creates a passion in your hearts for something. Amen. And I encourage all of you, those of you that have a passion that God has placed in your heart, to continue with that. And if you don't have that, seek, ask them. Ask him. He will give it to you. He will give you a passion. Even in the place that you are at. As Jeff mentioned, we're going to to um, work on the buildings and the churches that his, his dad has uh, planted. Uh, the majority of our churches are in La Vega and the city that we'll be living in at the current moment. Um, and, and we are excited. We uh, get the text messages every day. When are you coming? When are you getting here? You know, we've, we've talked with the leaders and they have a list of things. These are the things that we, we'd like to see happen here and things that have, they haven't been able to do on their own, and they're looking. Um, one of the things is we're looking to expand. We have a children's camp. In the summertime, we don't have a teen camp uh, for the lack of help and helpers and, and guidance and that. So that it is something that we'd like to see come, that the teens have a place to go to learn about God and, and to be loved on. Amen. And, uh, and we ultimately just want to tell people about Jesus. We want to tell people about the saving grace that God has for us, that he has the power to set us free from the burdens of our sin and the chains that we carry around with us, yes. that he has come, that we might have life, not just life where we sit there and say, well, one day I'll get to heaven, one day it'll get better, but he says that we can have life even here and life abundantly, and that is the message that we want to bring to this country. Um, the, the popular religion in the Dominican Republic is Roman Catholicism, um, but even with that, many of them only know of the rituals. They don't know of Jesus, uh, Jeff's father. On this past trip, we've been going down. Jeff's been going uh, for the past eight years, and I've been going for the past five. And uh, on this last trip down in March, we take a group um, from our missions down, and again, that is open to everybody. We go down for the Dominic Church Conference and we go around to the churches and and we pass out tracts in the neighborhoods and, and reconnect with those around them. But on the way down, just Father Dave, Brother Dave Eastman was sitting next to a Dominican and he started talking to him about Jesus and asked him if he knew of him. He looked at him and told him, the only thing I know about that Jesus from those paper things people pass out. 
And he said, so you mean the tracks? And he handed him a track and he told him. And that man looked at my father-in-law and said, but you don't understand. I'm a bad man. He says, I've done a lot of really bad things. And Jeff's father looked at him and said, but you don't know my Jesus. Praise God. Thank God. And he saved all of us. And he was able to pray the sinner's prayer with him right there on the plane. But I thought because somebody gave, because somebody went out and passed all those tracks, the seed was already planted. It was already there, ready, waiting for that day that the Holy Spirit began to pull on that man's heart. Uh, we do also have a church planted in our home. In the Dominic, it's a third world country. You cannot leave a house unattended. Um, you can't just build a home and say, hey, I'll come back in a year and live there and expect that nobody be living there. If you do that, it will be gone by the time you come back. <laughs> um, so we have a couple that has been living in our home. Uh, and the wife, uh, she's a church planner. She goes in, she plants a church, and when they pastors come in she goes on somewhere else and begins another home church so we have a church that meets in our home on wednesday nights and that will be ours when we get down to the dominic and we are excited for that also um, we we are looking to expand we've talked about the funds that come in whatever we don't need for our living expenses Above and beyond, we'll go into buying tracks. We don't realize how much tracks cost. Tracks cost money. And uh, Bibles, Bibles cost money. And I, I will tell you, um, just to kind of give you an idea of how precious Bibles are, when we were in, down on one of our trips, a woman on our trip brought several Bibles. Now, who here probably has at least five or six Bibles sitting around in their home that we've collected over the years? I know I do. For many of them, they don't even have one because of the cost that is involved. Because they they don't have the, the means to be able to buy a Bible because they're just worried about what they can put on the table for their children. And so she bought some Spanish Bibles down and um, we told her just wherever God leads, hand them out. We were up in the mountains ministering in a particular church that was a new church plant. And the church was located kind of right in the middle of a bunch of apartments, a lower income housing uh, in that city. And after church, she handed a Bible to one particular young man. And she handed it to him. And I was standing with her because we encourage people to stay in twos, <laughs> stay in groups. She handed him the Bible and he took that Bible. He was about in his 20s. He tucked it underneath his arm and he took off running. And she just kind of looked at me in a little, like, state of a shock. When you hand something to somebody, the last thing you expect them to do is turn around and run. And that's exactly what he did. He ran. And I said, I realized what was going on. I said, I said, just hold on one second. And I told the woman, I said, watch him. And he ran up into the apartments. He ran to his home. And when he came out, he didn't have the Bible. He had ran home to put the Bible away. And as soon as he came out, he had at least two or three men that were around him wanting to know where that Bible was and what he had done with it. He took it away because he was afraid they were going to take it from him because it is such a high commodity down there. We don't understand what we have here. We're spoiled in America. And, and I know even that for myself. We, we don't understand what that means to not have those sort of things in our life. To not to be able to even afford a Bible to read God's Word. And obviously with other things, um, that wherever God leads us, that's where we go. We are ready and willing and able. If you ever go on a mission trip, one thing I like to tell people is be ready for anything and anything at any point in time. Don't get so set on a schedule. You can't come on a mission trip with a schedule because it won't work. <laughs> You go in for a children's service and you have a bunch of adults. And so you've got to kind of change your plans and, and go where God leads you. You go in for an adult service and come and find out that the church only has kids in it. So you've got to readjust and, and look in that. And, and that just kind of gives you an idea of what we're doing. Uh, before I go any further, friendly, 
Now's the time for the slideshow. She has been waiting. I told her I was going to show her some pictures this morning. So this morning we are going to, I'm going to show you some pictures. As they say, pictures are worth a thousand words. And I can talk to you about it, but until you see it. There's Jeff and I um, getting ready to go out to do missions and hit the streets to show and tell others about Jesus. This is our home when we first bought it. Uh, and this in itself was such a huge blessing and a God story. If you've ever tried buying a home in the state, try buying one in a third world country. It's much difficult. <laughs> this is what it looks like now. And again, as my husband said, we want others to come and work alongside of us. We want you to get the burden for the mission and what it entails. Our children have gone to the Dominic. Uh, they don't quite remember it, um, but they went, and in this picture, they were trying to get coconut milk. That's coconut milk in the cup, and, and they were drinking it. This is our daughter, and if she were here today, she would tell you my name. It's Grace Lady Misielo Martinez Santana, but you can call me Cielo. Uh, she is excited for us to get down there. Uh, this church holds a dear place in our hearts. It's one that we personally helped build and raise the funds for. And it's amazing to see what God does. Uh, this church, they have a plot of land next to it that's ready for whenever the church needs to expand. But until the meantime, they grow fruits and vegetables and they use that to help feed their church members and then help feed those in the congregation. Our churches are pillar stones. They are corners in a community that people know that if they need to be set free. They, they need help. They know where to go. They know who the Christians are. God? They know and they're not ashamed to speak of the gospel. They are very bold and they are very firm in their faith. And they love to worship God. They love to come and I think how, how much our time gets spent doing other things here in America. We're easily distracted and we keep ourselves so busy that we don't have time to wait upon the Lord and seek Him. Uh, this is in McGuay. That was one of the first churches that um, was ever planted in the Dominic. And many times when we are in the Dominic, we are in the streets uh, trying to spread the gospel. Uh, we take time to talk with the children, play with the children. But as we mentioned, we pass out the tracts. The tracts are a quick way to get the gospel out and very effective. Those children you see did not pose for those pictures. When you hand them a track, they start reading it immediately. They'll take that track home. They'll pass it out to their mothers or fathers. And uh, in that country, they have multiple families living in one home. And it will make its way around um, to all those there. This is a young lady who just received her first Bible and, and uh, continued to pray for her. Her name is Angelica. And Angelica is going through teenage years and could definitely use our prayers. Uh, and this goes to show just kind of what it's like um, when you're going and hitting the street stuff we went down that one street and was talking to that man. And, and when he ended my track, the gentleman said that he hadn't been to a church in three years. But he said, but today I'm going to go back. This particular area is called St. Cristoba. It is almost as bad as Haiti in this area. But I love it because they're hungry for God. And in this next picture, you will see that group. That group was standing outside. We actually went to go check on the toilet situation in that church because the toilet had been stolen. Because they will steal anything that they can because they don't have a lot of money. But when we opened the doors to walk in, and this, I mind you, it was in the middle of the day, in the afternoon, probably around 2, we opened the doors and the church was filled. And we kind of looked around at each other and we thought, well, we didn't have plans of service today, but guess what? We're having church. Yeah. Could you imagine if you came on a Sunday and your pastor said, hey, I came on Thursday at 2 o'clock to check on the toilets and there were people waiting in the parking lot for church. So we had church on Thursday, but that's exactly what happened. And this kind of gives you an idea of what the homes look like. This is more in the city where there's cement homes, tin roof, but... Many of the homes are what we would consider a wood shack or a wood shed. But those are homes that is where people live and they rest their head uh, for the night. It is 
again, a third world country. Uh, the cattle roam the streets freely. I believe the cows go past our house at least twice a day. Um, many of the roads are dirt roads while they are starting to pave some of them. But again, it's amazing to see what Jesus does. And I love the stories, the long-term stories of seeing Christ change not just one life, but neighborhoods and lives. So this particular service, that young woman had been invited to church. That was her third service. And I was able to lead her to Christ. Why? Because somebody had invited her to church. And God saved and redeemed her. Um, many times they are washing their clothes by hand. Um, some of them might be blessed with a simple washing machine. Um, and you cannot drink the water coming out of the faucet. You have to drink it as a bag of water, uh, out of bags or out of bottles, um, or you'll end up getting sick. Many of them cook outside with coal. Uh, some of them do have propane stoves that they use um, inside the house. I tell often, um, you've never had chicken unless you've had Dominican fried chicken. It, it is good. But this church has one of the most awesome stories that I love to tell. This neighborhood used to be called the Tarantula because of the gang members in the neighborhood. Jeff's father planted a church there. God moved. God set people free. And Jesus redeemed them so much so they had to change the name of the neighborhood to Paradise because it was no longer the same. Uh, monthly income for Dominicans, you're looking at anywhere if they're doing street vending, selling, like these wonderful ladies are in the market, you're looking at about two to three hundred dollars a month. If they're blessed to have a full time job, possibly three to four hundred. Many of them have multiple jobs just to make ends meet. Uh, that does not mean that things are necessarily cheaper. Uh, some are, but a lot are not, and so therefore, if your income's only around three to four hundred, and you're expected to need about a thousand a month uh, to live comfortably, um, that's where you get many of the families living in multiple houses and trying to help and support one another. And with that, we have some faces of brothers and sisters in Christ. That's a blind shoe cobbler. Uh, that live next to a church. Many get to know Christ because a church is planted next to them. And that is how they come to know the Savior. This is Brother Mario. He is actually um, from Haiti, working in the Dominic. He makes $10 a day. And he does not, I've seen him work, and it's not easy work. We're talking construction, cement work, and he works in a long day and he only gets 10 bucks for that entire day. Uh, this is one of our churches up in the mountains. The previous slide, I know I missed him, is Brother Julio. Brother Julio has been planting churches up in the mountains for many years and God has used him in mighty ways. He's a man that I respect uh, with the utmost because of what he has allowed God to use him for. Uh, Dominicans are a lively culture. They are extremely friendly. Uh, they will love on you. They will accept you in. They will talk to you. And they are open, which makes it easy to share the gospel with them. And that is our daughter standing next to Jeff as well. We've known her for several years now. About like 40 years we, we have personally known her. But she's been in our churches her entire life. And this is our church conference right here. Uh, the Dominican church is kind of like our camp meetings that are all coming up, except they can only afford enough to meet on the weekends. And on Saturday, they have one day set aside for the children. And they bus them in. They truck them in any way possible. And our services run about two, 250 children. Um, they are amazing services to be in. They are anything short of um, kids loving and wanting to know Jesus. We have had a radio ministry for many years in the Dominic, and many have gotten saved through it. In the next few years, it's going to be moving into a media ministry, hoping to reach more people with the gospel. And that is Pastor Eddie Castillo. Um, I wish he could be here with you guys today. He's always got a smile on his face, and and 
loves to tell others about Jesus. We get to the end of the slide, and these are my favorite ones. Why? Because these are what they call a new work. A new work is a new church. Somebody goes into the neighborhood, they evangelize, they begin to tell them about Jesus. New converts come up. Jesus begins to set people free, and they need a place to gather and worship. This particular one is so new, it's not even considered, it's not an established church yet at the moment. They're currently renting that building. Um, that will be a project that we will need to raise money so we can build them one. But this wonderful lady, and that's the last slide right there. She lived right behind the church. And after the service, she came up to me and she said, I'm going to be naming my son Jaden as well. She was pregnant with her third boy and she was so excited and we talked. And as we talked and she so proudly showed us her home that was right behind the church. And I got into the van and we were leaving that area. And as we were on our way out, I could hear the Holy Spirit begin to speak to me and talk to my heart. And I thought, God, I could have been her. That could have been me. Living in that home. I have three boys. Young is the same name. But I was blessed to grow up in the States. But that could have been me sitting there waiting for somebody to tell me. There is someone who can set me free. Praise God. And I don't have to go to bed at night in fear. I don't have to go to bed at night worrying about tomorrow. But I can trust and know that I have a Savior who knows how many hairs that are on my head. And if he feeds the birds, I can rest assured that he will feed us too. Amen. Praise but because somebody gave, because somebody prayed, because somebody went, she now knows of that Savior. Praise God. Praise God. And that is what it's about, church. That is why we are here. God does not simply set us free so we can fill ourselves fat on His grace. He sets us free so that it fills us up, so it has to come out. It has to go somewhere. And we are never too old. We are never too young. We are never to anything that God cannot use us. Right. Praise God. So I do want to get into the Word today. I was praying about what Scripture and where God wanted me to go. And as I talk, I will um, share more stories of our ministry there. Um, 